Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei in Beijing. To commemorate the 30th anniversary since the UN passed the Declaration on the Right to Development in 1986, China issued a white paper Thursday to clarify its philosophy, practice, and contribution in promoting people's right to development. How does China view the right to development, and what more should be done to promote it? Against the background of a weak global economic recovery and the rising anti-globalization trend, what are the challenges for both China and the rest of the world to better protect people's right to development? How should international cooperation be promoted, and what role can China play in its success? To discuss these issues and more, I'm very happy to be joined in the studio by Liu Huawen, Executive Director of Human Rights Studies at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And Tom Azwat, professor of human rights of Utrecht University and director of the Netherlands School of Human Rights Research. But before we begin our discussion, let's take a look at this. On December 4, 1986, the United Nations adopted the Declaration on the Right to Development, which states that. Every human person and all peoples are entitled to participate in, contribute to, and enjoy economic, social, cultural, and political development, in which all human rights and fundamental freedoms can be fully realized. Since then, understandings of the right to development have been divergent among global members. The head of the CPC Publicity Department, Liu Qibao, shared China's perspective. We believe that the rights to subsistence and development are the primary basic human rights. The right to development is an extension and guarantee of the right to subsistence. It is a comprehensive and universal human right. Ladies and gentlemen, poverty eradication continues to be one of the critical elements in the promotion and realization of the right to development. Its success will be measured, therefore, by the impact of the goals on the lives of the poorest and the most vulnerable. In this regard, China's experience serves as an example for other countries. Over the past three decades, China has lifted 700 million people out of poverty and implemented reforms on land use rights, education, social security, and health care. The United Nations Development Program in 2016 ranks China in the 90th place out of 188 countries in terms of human development level, and says China belongs to the high-level group. However, the UNDP also says China still faces a number of challenges, including social inequalities, economic slowdowns, and an aging population. China's Gini coefficient, which measures a country's wealth gap, has surpassed the international red line of 0.4. The UNDP is encouraging China to use social innovation to increase its inclusiveness, pursue more equal development, and narrow the gap between different regions, social groups, and genders. Feng Xing, CCTV, in Beijing. Gentlemen. The first question is about why human rights is prioritized on the agenda of discussing development、uh, rights and rights to development. There's a clear link between the two. <clears throat> I would say that there's a difference in viewing the right to development between people in the West, where I come from, and people in Asia and other parts of the Southern Hemisphere. In the West, we tend to as- associate the right to development with money and economic growth. While in Asia, Africa, there's a clear link between the right to development and human dignity.、Uh, it's important that people have access to sanitation, hygiene, to clear water, to food on the table, ac- affordable healthcare. These are all parts of the right to development. This is what the Central Committee has called people-centered development. So there's a clear link between the two. Human、uh, human dignity is almost everywhere considered to be. 
a supreme right, a supreme human right. Uh, and therefore, I also understand that in China, the right to development and the right to subsistence is seen as a paramount right that fits perfectly into that human dignity narrative. We are clearly aware of the official rhetoric uh, of the Chinese spokesperson about the differences between West understanding of human rights and our understanding of our subsistence. Uh, now, uh, this gentleman also uh, used the idea of the West as opposed to Asia in his interpretation about the uh, human rights and our understanding about this. So what do you think of the discrepancies here? Um, so I attended the, the said uh, uh, international seminar to celebrate uh, the uh, 30th anniversary of adoption of the UN Declaration on Right to Development. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, we listened to the congratulatory uh, letter sent by our president, uh, uh, Mr. Xi Jinping. Um, I uh, feel excited because uh, it means uh, it shows uh, the great uh, significance attached by our government uh, to the cause of human rights. Uh, what's more, it uh, expresses uh, clearly the Chinese version of human rights, the Chinese understanding of human rights. For a long time, we view uh, right to existence, right to development uh, as the primary uh, basic rights. Um, so it's the very nature of our uh, outlook of human rights with the Chinese characteristics. Um, Excuse me, what do you mean by human rights with the Chinese characteristics? Uh, that means uh, for a long time, uh, traditionally, especially according to the Western uh, uh, definition of human rights, uh, uh, mainly it, uh, uh, poli civil political rights is not uh, economic or social cultural rights. Uh, um, meanwhile, I want to uh, mention that it's not uh, just a Chinese uh, uh, understanding. Um, uh, so China, together with uh, uh, the other uh, uh, so many developing countries, uh, uh, under uh, developed countries, uh, uh, we advocate uh, the uh, right to development. Uh, actually, the first time uh, to uh, legalize the, the, this term uh, is in 1981. Uh, Article 22 of the African uh, Charter on uh, human and uh, people's rights uh, for the first time uh, uh, stipulated, uh, uh, stipulates the uh, right to development. I somehow disagree with you, uh, Professor Zawad, that uh, uh, in, in Asia we prioritize a human dignity over uh, the issue of uh, money and, and, and wealth. In fact, in, in much of uh, East, the East, people attach importance to uh, bread and butter, the livelihoods of the ordinary folks, so the disadvantaged social groups, instead of uh, uh, you know um, political participation to ensure social justice and human dignity. For l a long time, majority in developing countries, in particular in China, we would believe uh, that's your term in the West about the human dignity. For China, without the decency of uh, basic livelihood, <coughs> you would not talk smart about using the ballot box. I think that the disagreement between us is not so big because the problem is that in the East and in the West, we share the same view, the share the same ambitions, but we use different language. Mm -hmm. And we're not always aware of that. And therefore, we need to make clear to each other better than we do now uh, what we mean when we use a certain concept. For example, the concept of human rights is usually related to Europe, but actually human rights as a concept are very old, even older than the European label. They, they were there in China for millennia already. So what we have decided to do to make clear that it's a language issue rather than an issue of principle is to bring together scholars from all over the world, from different traditions, to discuss human rights. We have set up a cross-cultural human rights center here in Beijing in 2014, and we have scholars from all over the world, mainly from Asia and Africa, and we discuss these issues. And when you talk to each other, it becomes clear that sometimes you use different words to express the same ambition, or you have different ambitions using the same word. And when you do that, it's very easy to find common solutions. We're now even developing what we call a common southern vision on human rights, just to explain what people in 
Asia, Africa mean when they talk about human rights. I think that's a very prom promising start. Do you believe our public awareness on human rights depends on level of economic development? For example, in the early days of the People's Republic uh, since 1949, when the average lifespan of the Chinese people would only be about 50 years, uh, and the famine, all kinds of diseases uh, threatened to uh, deprive uh, our lives, then is it so necessary to talk about uh, equal participation in politics and the use of ballot box? You're quite right. Uh, actually, uh, in my eyes, uh, the human rights standards, uh, international human rights law is a dynamic uh, system. So it's not uh, fixed. Uh, 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 over time, it, uh, uh, it uh, develops uh, quickly. And according to the development of the uh, society, of the economy, um, Yes, uh, uh, universally there are some basic values, there are some uh, uh, kind of uh, common international standards uh, uh, reflected mainly by the United Nations Human Rights Treaties, but uh, to be detailed... Excuse me, does China sign or has China signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Charter? Um, uh, so, um, there the UN Charter. Uh, Has China signed the uh, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights? For the UN Declaration, it is the resolution of the General Assembly, not, not necessary to uh, ratify or sign. But uh, we you have, have signed, but that has not been ratified by the top legislature here. Uh, uh, I, I want to say that we haven't uh, uh, ratified the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights. Uh, but what about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is, as my colleague says, not a treaty, so it doesn't have it's to be ratified. It's not a treaty. It but doesn't have to be signed. What is interesting yeah. to note is that the main architect of the Universal Declaration was the Chinese representative on the panel. Mm -hmm. If you read the document, it contains all kinds of Chinese values. In the first uh, article, there's a reference to the notion of run, which you all know very well in China. Uh, so how Chinese can it be? Uh, what we are doing with this, this comprehensive southern vision is to build on this, this great uh, document, which is also a Chinese document. Yeah, so we contribute a lot uh, to the drafting uh, the, uh, the declaration. And after that, uh, uh, the key uh, uh, task is to uh, realize uh, the principles, uh, the, the purposes set uh, in the uh, Universal Declaration on Human Rights. So there, then uh, the UN made uh, many uh, core human rights treaties. Uh, it uh, detailed the, the standards. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say Mr. Liu, that some countries in the past years have tended to politicize human rights in China. Uh, unfortunately, it's the fact. Uh, uh, and uh, during the past uh, decades, uh, um, uh, human rights uh, uh, from time to time uh, are used as a political uh, tool to produce pressure upon uh, 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 developing countries like us. Um, I say it's not uh, uh, constructive. So the international exchanges, the international corporations uh, are uh, much more uh, important uh, uh, compared uh, with uh, before, but uh, we, we have to uh, follow international law, follow the principle of mutual respect, uh, the principle of equality. The mere issue of uh, universality as opposed to cultural diversity would trigger a debate for hours to clarify uh, what we aspire to respect in such discussions about human rights. But you are watching dialogue with uh, Professor Tom Zwart and Professor Liu Hua Wen. We are discussing the recent declaration about right to development between and among developing and developed nations. We'll be back in a few minutes. Please stay with us. Welcome back. China is a huge country and therefore we have this immediate problem of uneven development between the more prosperous coastal areas and the underdeveloped areas like Gansu, Qinghai, Tibet and the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. What about the protection of minority rights in the underdeveloped areas? What, what, how much do you learn about China? 
Well, we learn a lot about China, and I would say the opportunities we now have as scholars to come to this country and to discuss with our colleagues are so, so helpful in really understanding the country. I myself am involved in a project where we deal with the minority issue, the rights of Muslims in this country, the Hui Muslims in particular. And we do so on the basis of a speech given by the General Secretary Xi Jinping in April of this year, where he called for localization of religion. So what we're going to do with a number of Chinese scholars is to look into how much localization Muslims in China are actually engaging in. And I did some preliminary uh, research. Excuse me, what do you mean by localization of the minority group? Uh, is that uh, an issue of engagement? To engage well, in it's, minority a, rights it's a three With equal access to education, employment, so on no, and so forth. No, it's not about care, rights, it's about example. duties. It's more about duties. That if you are a religious minority, you're allowed to enjoy your religion, but at the same time, you have to blend in into society and to accept China's constitutional and political system. And the question that we are raising. As to what extent do Muslims in China are localizing already? And again, the project will start in March in earnestness, but I did some preliminary research and it's very promising. It shows that for centuries Muslims in China are already localizing a lot. Uh, when you study the manuals written by Islam scholars in China, they try to combine the, the, the teachings of Islam with the current uh, views of society in China. And that's a very promising development. Part of uh, uh, globalization or the pervasive use of the internet, I'm afraid, in this age of uh, digital technology is the spread of uh, Islamic extremism. If you look at the rise of the Turkish Islamic movement uh, that caused uh, much of the social and religious uh, instability in Xinjiang, what, what do you think of the challenges lying ahead and how should we protect the religious rights, free, religious freedom, at the same time, uh, we would uh, minimize the danger of uh, extremism to maintain social law and order and stability. Um, you are right uh, that uh, protection uh, of uh, human rights uh, uh, is facing uh, many uh, challenges. Uh, uh, some challenge is uh, rather new. Uh, we didn't face this kind of uh, challenge before. Uh, but uh, uh, in my eyes, uh, uh, when we face a complicated uh, situation, we have to find uh, some uh, uh, correct uh, 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 principles that are the right key to the right solution to the problems. Uh, I think uh, rule of law is the very basic uh, uh, issue uh, to face this kind of situation. There's no doubt about respecting rule of law. However, do you think the use of internet and the smartphones have uh, helped to narrow the perception gap or in, in, in enlarge uh, the divisions uh, between dif different ethnic groups because we've been talking about how to integrate minority groups uh, into the mainstream society, namely the Han majority. Very often I think uh, technology uh, can help uh, but uh, uh, for sure, we, uh, again I want to mention the rule of law, so we need uh, legislation on the uh, cyberspace, <coughs> on the uh, 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 media, including social media. So necessary uh, 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 policies or, or regulations uh, sh should be there. Uh, so uh, we we need the help of the technology to promote uh, right to education, to uh, promote uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, freedom of expression and so many. So it can help human rights. Meanwhile, it could be also be a threat to human rights. Today, uh, Professor Watt and Professor Liu, China is rapidly going through a period of a social and economic transformation with a growing uh, middle class uh, whose uh, demand for political participation and rule of law, social justice, might be unprecedented if you look at the Chinese history. Because uh, never before has we had such an enormous demand, insatiable demand for rule of law in our political vocabulary today. <coughs> you look at the uh, don't call me uh, Madame Bovary or uh, Chuji goes to court that was produced by Zhang Yimou quite a few years back yeah. in the 1980s. People have developed a basic sense of justice. <coughs> they want to be protected by the rule of law. Now, what do you think of the social progress and the challenges? I think that this is phenomenal, I would say, but I would also say that the rule of law has always been there. Perhaps there have been peri periods of turmoil where that was not the case. 
But in China, mm. there is always a wonderful combination of moral rules and legal rules. And that combination has been a huge success. And I would say the fact that people believe now more in formal law, law adopted by the National People's Congress <coughs> and its Standing Committee, that should be applauded. But you should not forget that China has always had a very sound moral basis as well. And I applaud these, these attempts by the Central Committee, especially its fourth plenum, to enforce the rule of law. We've seen that the National People's Congress has adopted a lot of legislation to, to, put, to put flesh to the bones. And I see that this is a very promising development. Let, let me go back to the idea of a middle class, uh, which has somehow become a sensitive concept for many scholars who would rather prefer to use middle income families because they are afraid that they might fall into the trap of the Western political vocabulary or political science, which prefers to take the middle class as a powerful symbol of social justice and the rule of law. What do you think of the Chinese concerns about the differences between the two concepts, middle income families and the middle class? Uh, I'm not sure whether I catch your question clearly. Uh, what I want to say is that today um, uh, our society uh, changes quite quickly, and uh, it's, uh, mm, as you said, uh, it's a transitional period. Mm -hmm. So it's very much important uh, to identify uh, what kind of situation we are in and what are the real challenges uh, ahead. Uh, so it's uh, rather important uh, for the policymakers, for the legislators, uh, to evaluate uh, the, the, the new situation, to follow the new social trend. Uh, I see the new social trend is uh, uh, human rights, uh, rule of law, uh, this kind of thing. And uh, now we are talking about the right to uh, development. Uh, if we read the uh, uh, new released uh, white paper, it uh, reflects clearly that uh, right to development is not just uh, about uh, economic rights, it's also about uh, political rights. So it's a comprehensive uh, development, uh, not uh, in a narrow sense. But why we attach so, uh, so much importance, uh, to, uh, importance to uh, right to development, uh, in my eyes, uh, it uh, relates to our culture, our uh, philosophy. Uh, always uh, we try to uh, use a holistic uh, approach. So we think uh, the relevant uh, elements uh, uh, should be considered together. So uh, peace, uh, stability, and uh, uh, de development, uh, uh, human rights, they are interrelated. Whenever we talk to Europeans or Americans about the idea of uh, human rights in a developing country, the Chinese side would prefer to emphasize the importance of uh, maintaining stability to guarantee smooth and rapid development, whilst the West would argue, look, that's likely to sacrifice uh, individual liberty. Now, Professor Samuel Huntington, who wrote many books about uh, political changes, uh, political order in a changing society, would argue, um, when you look at the issue of uh, individual liberty and the social order, it's always the social order that would first and foremost come across as the most important, mm -hmm. without which you would not be able to exercise your individual liberty. Do you think what he says carry any ring of truth? I do, and I would say that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights also does, and that's perhaps even more important than Samuel Huntington, because the, the Universal Declaration is written as a document that should appeal to as many people as possible. That's why it's called the Universal Declaration. It should engage all people everywhere, and it allows countries to make choices. So if in a country like China, stability mm -hmm. or subsistence is deemed more important, that is no problem. In the U.S. they feel that the freedom of expression is some kind of a, of a superior right. They're allowed to do that. That's what the Universal Declaration allows. That's why it's such a beautiful document. The only thing we should try to prevent is that liberal people in Europe and the U.S. hijack the document and say, listen, this is a charter for individual liberty and autonomy, while other societies might value other values, and they're fully entitled to do so. A couple of days ago, I was watching a video footage uh, mm -hmm. about Jack Ma, uh, chairman of Alibaba, talking about the importance of the environmental protection because, you know, every day the major cities uh, uh, are enveloped in hazardous fog due to the industrialization. Uh, he says uh, what he holds so dear is the air quality. And 
the uh, environmental protection. Otherwise, you know, ma majority of the Chinese consumers uh, would lose their index of <coughs> happiness, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, what do you think of uh, the relationship between climate change and our environmental protection? He's absolutely right in many respects, but this respect as well. That is why I like the fact that the whole campaign to eradicate uh, poverty in this country, which I would say is the biggest uh, human rights accomplishment in the history of humankind, and that's not, we should not pay too much attention to UN special rapporteurs not acknowledging that. It goes hand in hand with all kinds of measures taken by the State Council. I've seen that there's a, a deforestry program which is tied to the campaign to eradicate uh, poverty, which is very impressive. There's a 50 billion uh, euros uh, amount of money involved. So they take both very seriously, and that's what I like. That's not what we always do in the West, by the way. Do you agree? Yeah, I agree, yeah. <laughs> And uh, env environmental protection is uh, uh, rather important today. And uh, uh, uh but President-elect Donald Trump threatens to withdraw from the Paris Climate Change Agreement. I see. Uh, uh, Mr. Trump uh, is to defend uh, the the interests of U.S. It's natural. But I want to, if I could, I want to remind him that uh, what are the interests of the uh, U.S. So clim climate change uh, will affect uh, all of us, uh, all of the countries, all the people around the world, uh, including U.S. So international corporations not just benefit uh, developing countries, the least. Uh, Developed, uh, developed, uh, developed country. Um, U.S. also uh, will benefit a lot from the uh, implementation of the Paris Agreement. Well, all politics are local. Um, it's bipartisanship. It's uh, about the electorate. <laughs> so, do you think this kind of uh, protectionism in the area of, EU, of the environmental protection? would further embarrass uh, the future of uh, the whole world. I am against protectionism in any way. <clears throat> I would say that the Donald Trump position is understandable, perhaps not defensible, but it's understandable. He is, is facing angry voters who have been the victims of the, the effects of globalization, but that doesn't mean that globalization has stopped. He will have to explain to his people why globalization is still important, and he has to find a way to support the people who had suffered in his country. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.